There, that'll be better. We're going to give people just a couple more minutes because we're not quite all of our, our registries are not here. So we're going to give them just about one more minute and then we will be ready to begin. So can just be patient and we'll be with you very shortly. Sounds good. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. So uh, welcome again to the TAP webinar series. Um, this is our, our third one so far in 2020. We're delighted today to be able to bring you uh, Dr. Eric Rebeck of Oklahoma State University to talk about greenhouse pest management. He was a presenter for one of our TAP conferences last fall, and uh, everybody really, really enjoyed it and learned tons. So we were delighted that he agreed to come back and present again. So we will have questions at the end that you can type in a box on the far right hand side. Um, and if you have any technical problems with that or whatever, uh, if if you know me, you can text me or whatever. If not, um, there's also another uh, chat element down there. So anyway, we'll just try and work it out best we can. But um, if you can save your questions till the end, we'll do a Q&A session at the end. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Rebeck. Thank you, Jane. Can you uh, can you hear me? Um, I can I can hear you, and I think I think everybody else should be able to hear you as well. Okay, and can you see my screen? Um, no, we cannot see your screen yet. Okay, let me try one more time. How about now? No, I'm still seeing the, huh. let's see. Am I in presenter mode? you should be so you're in the presenter and let's see okay let's try again okay oh yeah here we go now I've got the prompt to show my screen and there we go okay great awesome we're back in business. Well, it's a pleasure to uh, quote unquote be here uh, online speaking to you anyway. Um, Jane had uh, and Colin had asked uh, me to uh, provide this presentation that I gave last fall um, at the Butterfly Gardens uh, to uh, a broader audience this time. Um, and uh, we're gonna be covering today um, basically conservation, uh, what's called conservation biological control. Um, it's a strategy that we can use as part of a uh, broader um, integrated pest management or IPM program um, that not only benefits our uh, ability to combat pests in our crops, but also helps to preserve or conserve um, those natural enemies, those insects that we, we consider the, the good guys, uh, predators and parasitoids. It helps preserve their numbers. It also helps to conserve pollinators as well, since uh, um, one of the basic tenets of conservation biocontrol is reducing uh, the impacts of pesticides or even um, eliminating the, the use of, of pesticides, including insecticides altogether. Um, so you can see my, my uh, credentials there, my, my information on the title slide here. Um, if, uh, if for whatever reason you're not able to uh, enter a, uh, a question into the chat box or speak online at the conclusion of the talk, um, feel free to send me an email. My email address um, is shown um, at the bottom left there. And then, uh, of course, I'm also on Twitter. I'm not religious about my use of Twitter, but uh, I do have a few followers. So feel free to uh, join and join me on Twitter and um, and follow me. And uh, and I do try to come up with uh, timely, uh, usually pest management advice um, relating to horticultural crop management. So. Anyways, away, away we go. 
So let's start with some definitions. First of all, what is biological control? What are we talking about? Well, biological control simply could be uh, defined as the use of any organism to reduce the abundance or the density, that's the number occurring per unit area. So uh, the number of aphids on a leaf is, uh, is a recording of the density. Um, so it's, a, it's the use of that organism to control or reduce the abundance or density of any other organism, what we would typically consider a pest organism. And there are a few agents at play. Um, we call biocontrol agents or natural enemies. Um, we have predators, we have parasitoids, and we have pathogens, the three Ps. And broadly, we speak of these as beneficial insects. And when we, when we, when we say that, we're also including pollinators. So instead of the three Ps of biocontrol, we could be talking about, or should be talking about, the four Ps um, of beneficial insects. So predators, parasitoids, pathogens, um, as well as pollinators. And if that, I, I uh, preluded myself here. We are, uh, um, the next slide shows exactly what we're talking about, those four Ps, the, the predators, parasitoids, pathogens, and pollinators. And so let's take each of these groups in turn, minus the pollinators, because there's, there's so many to talk about. Uh, okay, predators. So what are they? Well, first of all, um, both adults and immatures are often what we call generalists. They have a broad diet. They feed on a wide variety of different um, organisms, different insects. Um, during their lifetime, they can, can, they can kill and consume many prey. That, that's required in order for them to uh, sustain their life processes. Um, they're generally larger and faster than their prey. They, they have to be in order to uh, subdue, track down, subdue, and then uh, ultimately kill and consume their prey items. Worldwide, there could be as many as 200,000 species of, of arthropod predators, um, and, um, and, and that list just grows um, with, when, with new discoveries all the time, especially down in the tropics. And then they remove the evidence, and, and what does that mean? Well, it means that, yes, they're out in the environment, they're out in our landscapes feeding on other insects, but they don't leave really much evidence behind that they've been there and that they've, that they've, you know, that they've eaten something. Um, they, they pretty much remove everything. So unless we're lucky enough to kind of catch them in the act of, of being a predator, of eating another organism, um, we don't really notice their effect. We don't notice that they're actually there. And there's lots of examples of predators. We're only going to cover just a, a, a very few here in the time we have today. But um, very commonly, when, when, when you think insect predator, uh, we think uh, lady beetles. Um, and so here's a, a good example um, of the convergent lady beetle, one of our native lady beetle species. Um, and they can concern, they can, um, uh, some lady beetle species, um, individual lady beetles can uh, consume um, up to about 100 aphids per day, depending on the size of the aphid, um, that sort of thing. So, so they can really, just one individual predator can have a very large impact um, in, our, uh, in our landscapes. Um, and it, uh, it's also not just the, uh, the, the adults, but also, as I mentioned earlier, the immatures. Um, lady beetle larvae can serve as, as predators as well. Um, and I, I'm going to go back a slide. Yes, good. I'm glad I put that in there. Um, that left-hand picture just next to the uh, praying mantis, uh, that's actually a lady beetle larva. Um, many people wonder what the heck that thing is. It looks kind of like a foreign creature, kind of like an alien. Um, or a kind of a black and orange alligator, um, and and it's those are actually the larvae of lady beetles. So so if you see those, and they're they're out right now, they're all over the my backyard and in my my garden area. Um, so so look for these um, these and, and don't think they're pests. They're actually predators doing you doing you good. Okay, so other predators include lacewings, which should be out now as well. At least the adult stages. Um, the adult is shown in the bottom left panel. Um, but the adults, uh, at least for green lacewings, there are several species, and this is the green lacewing. The adults only feed on floral nectar, but the larvae are voracious predators of, of soft-bodied insects, uh, especially aphids and, and small caterpillars and things of that nature. Um, if they can catch it and subdue it, they will eat it. They're, they're just, uh, just superb predators. Um, and they do have those large grasping jaws. Um, it's not for chewing, though. Those uh, sickle-like 
jaws are used for piercing and sucking out uh, the, the juices from their prey items that they, that they catch. Um, and the eggs are up on stalks. So you can see uh, two pictures of eggs here, one a big cluster of them in the bottom right. But a little closer up on the um, upper left, we see that egg that's on a silken stalk. And they're up on those silken stalks, um, kind of a little evolutionary trick um, that allows these insects to not feed on themselves. It helps protect them from one another because they are such voracious predators, they will cannibalize one another if given the chance. So um, Mother Nature, in her wisdom, put them up on these stalks to protect them from themselves. Other things, things that we, we probably don't even see um, because they're so small, include insects like this, the minute pirate bug. Um, sometimes it's called the insidious flower bug. Um, and it is a predatory bug. It has piercing sucking mouth parts um, and it uses those to take a blood meal from its victims, from its prey. And we can see that in the bottom right picture here. They get the name minute pirate bug because they are indeed that, they are very, very small, not microscopic. You can see them with the naked eye, but you might not really quite know what you're seeing um, on a flower head where they are typically found, um, quite often feeding on nectar and pollen um, as a supplemental portion of their diet. Um, they're just, they're very incredibly small, but they're really effective predators. And, and in fact, they're used in um, biological control programs in greenhouse management uh, quite commonly. And they occur naturally around us all over. Spiders, we cannot you know, leave the discussion of predators without talking about spiders. 99.99% of all species of spider are predators um, on other, um, on other, ins on other um, arthropods, and as including um, a lot of our pest insects. Uh, they have, um, so they're, they're all over the place. Some build webs, some are, um, some are ambush predators, um, others, um, uh, so they kind of lie in wait like this crab spider here shown in the picture. In fact, they employ camouflage quite often to blend in with their surroundings. Okay, so that's predators, just a, a brief uh, snapshot of those. What about parasitoids? If you've got predator, well, you've got to have alien, right? And that's exactly what we're talking about with parasitoids because they have a very uh, similar behavior to what you might be familiar with from the movie Alien. So they are more or less specialized in their choice of host. Uh, they do, so, so they're not, they don't have a broad diet like the predators. I apologize for the background uh, printing uh, sound. My, my wife must be printing something, I apologize. Um, so they're more or less specialized in their diet. They, they don't really have a broad uh, diet. They, they, they specialize on you know, several species, maybe in some cases only one particular species of pest insect. Um, like in the movie Alien, they develop from an egg that is laid in or on a host, um, and then they consume that host from the inside out, ultimately killing it. Um, there are two insect orders that, um, that predominantly display uh, this, this parasitism behavior, acting as parasitoids. The order Hymenoptera, which are uh, wasps, bees, um, and then uh, and ants, and then Diptera, which, um, include, uh, which are true flies. Um, and there could be up to 1 million species worldwide. We, we don't know the exact figure here again because new things are being discovered all the time as well, but um, pretty incredible diversity in, uh, in, these, in these insects. The vast, the vast majority of which are wasps, by the way, minute, uh, most of them are minute, small parasitic wasps. Um, they have to be smaller than their host, unlike predators, because um, they do lay that egg and develop within the host as, as an immature, in their immature stage. Um, and then they do leave ev evidence behind. And I think I have some pictures coming up to kind of show you what that means. We can actually see the results of parasitism happening um, when, we, when, we encounter, um, when we encounter it in our field or uh, landscape. And here's a prime example. If you grow tomatoes, you have undoubtedly encountered tomato hornworms. Um, and these are the cocoons all over the body of this, uh, this caterpillar. Um, these are the cocoons of a tiny parasitic wasp uh, in the genus Cotesia, shown in the inset there. Um, and those, those females lay multiple eggs inside of that large caterpillar. 
those eggs hatch into larval wasps that then feed internally on all the, the good bits uh, within that caterpillar. And then again, they ultimately will kill that, uh, that caterpillar. So these cocoons will ultimately hatch into adults, they'll mate and then find new uh, larvae to parasitize uh, later on. There are aphid specialists too, um, like Aphidius culmini shown in the picture here, where the female lays um, a typically one egg inside of each of those, those aphids that she selects. Um, and then again, that, that, lar that egg hatches into a larva that con consumes the, uh, uh, the aphid from the inside out. And this is um, what I meant also by evidence left behind. We, we see evidence of parasitism. Um, these are what we call aphid mummies. Um, they um, are aphids that are parasitized tend to swell up, they change color, and ultimately they, of course, they die off. Um, and then you'll, you might see the exit hole where the adult wasp has emerged from the inside of that cadaver, inside that mummy. Um, and again, this is these are left behind for a while after the active parasitism has happened. And so um, if you find a patch of aphids and you see a bunch of aphid mummies around, you know that there are parasitoids out there um, in your little garden patch uh, that are uh, attacking those aphids. So um, it might be good to kind of leave them alone and, and um, see what happens. All right, and then pathogens, which aren't insects, right? These are microbes, these are microorganisms that make insects sick and ultimately can kill them. So just like with people, right? Um, zombies as a fictional representation, but um, maybe even more scary these days uh, is COVID-19. So yeah, insects get sick too. And what do these pathogens do? Well, they kill, they reduce reproduction or the reproductive capacity of their hosts, uh, their host insects. They can slow their metabolism down, slow their growth, and also shorten the, the life of the pest. So even if they don't ultimately kill that, that pest insect, um, they, they certainly will inhibit its ability to um, act as a pest. It may take several days to provide control. Um, so this isn't a very rapid uh, process. It takes time for that infection to spread through the population of insects and, um, and then ultimately uh, um, provide some management and control. They're typically very specific uh, to their host, um, and they do leave evidence behind. We we see cadavers of insects that have been um, that have been killed off by uh, by some kind of pathogen. Um, they're they're left behind. Um, so we have a lot of cool things out in nature that are affecting um, uh, negatively affecting these these insects. Um, so we have fungi. So we have a picture here of a fungus that has. Um, already uh, reproduced inside the body of this tussock moth caterpillar. Um, and then it bursts through the cuticle, um, its fruiting bodies kind of burst through that cuticle and release spores back out in the environment because the end game for a pathogen like a fungus is to get those spores out in the environment and try to infect new targets, new hosts. And there are just countless examples of um, fun, fungal spores or, or fungal species that are out there that affect a wide variety of different types of arthropods, including many insect pests. And again, that evidence is left behind. You see the, the fruiting bodies here on these different in these different pictures, um, just uh, showing you know that's that's the, that's their their sporulation. They're trying to get those spores out into the environment. Okay, so now that we've had a brief introduction on the players, those biocontrol agents, the, the three Ps, um, how do we use them? How do we use them to uh, great effect within our gardens um, and within our, our cropping systems? Well, there are basically two ways that, that we have power to do as growers. Um, one is to conserve what we have, and that's what we're gonna primarily talk about today. Um, so conserve what's already occurring around us in, in nature. You could also add what you need. Now, this is primarily what's done in a greenhouse type scenario where there's no natural enemies, there's no um, predators or parasitoids or even pathogens uh, in that greenhouse environment. So we introduce them into that greenhouse. Um, usually we're, we're purchasing commercially available natural enemies um, that we can then buy in large amounts and release into that greenhouse um, to try to exact some control over uh, whatever the pest issue may be, aphids, white flies, thrips, you name it. 
but we're not going to talk about that today. That's a that's called augmentation biocontrol. We're going to stick to conservation biocontrol because we're talking primarily outdoors. Not that you can't augment outside either. It just doesn't work as well as it does in a nice confined environment like within a greenhouse. So let's uh, focus on conserving our beneficials. So how to conserve the good guys? And in most cases, it's really the good gals because we're talking primarily quite often those uh, those female parasitoids, those parasitic wasps um, that that do the dirty work. They do the they do the attacking of the pests. Um, so one thing I, I might have alluded to this earlier is modifying our pesticide use and specifically insecticides. What can we do? Well, we can reduce the amount or the frequency of our applications. Um, so we're trying to minimize contact mm -hmm. between the beneficial organisms, which include pollinators, of course, um, as well as um, those, those natural enemies, the predators and parasitoids. So we're trying to reduce that contact of that, that toxic chemical with those non-target uh, species. Another thing we can do is apply the insecticide when beneficials are not active. So sometimes, yes, we do need to use insecticides. And no matter what type of insecticide or pesticide we're using, it's best to apply early, early in the morning or later into the evening to try to, again, minimize contact between that toxic chemical and the non-target uh, beneficial organisms. If we are using insecticides, it's best to try to use more selective products. Now, selective does not mean that they don't work. Selective products are just as effective as some of our conventional insecticides like seven or wasp sprays or, or, or ant killers that you might buy in a spray can that, um, that, that get a quick effect on the pest. These selective products are more narrow spectrum. They only work on a, on a, on a, a small subset uh, of the types of insects that we call pests. So one example here that I've listed is uh, BT. Uh, which is short for the uh, bacterium Bacillus thuringiensis, and it's actually a subspecies Kerstaki, so it's really BTK that we use for controlling caterpillar pests. So um, right uh, this month, coming up in May, one thing to be looking out for, uh, at least in our ornamental plants, would be bagworms, which are a caterpillar pest. Um, and we can use BT effectively when we apply that reduced risk selective product when those caterpillars are young. So just one example of a product we can use specifically against caterpillars, it's not going to affect anything else. It does not have any toxic effect on honeybees that might be visiting the area also that are, um, if, they, if they happen to come in contact with BT, it's not going to harm them whatsoever because this product must be ingested by the caterpillars and it only works on true caterpillars, the larvae of butterflies and moths. Um, that, that we find as pests. Um, and then, so, so that's one way, modified pesticide use. Another way is to provide resources, um, including resource, what we call resource plants that provide food or shelter or a reproductive uh, uh, area, uh, like a nesting situation uh, for natural enemies. Oh, um, just again, uh, just a brief mention of those um, those selective um, narrow spectrum um, insecticides. These are, by the way, um, a list of those that are OMRI approved insecticides. Um, be, OMRI being the um, Organic Materials Review, Review Group that um, that reviews those materials and lists them to um, be usable with, uh, in a in a in a um, in an organic management scenario. So. If you're an organic grower, a certified organic grower, you can only be using these OMRI approved insecticides. And this list, I'm not going to uh, beat the bush here, but it's just a small sampling again of the uh, different types of, of these reduced risk, narrower spectrum insecticides that aren't gonna cause broad harm to uh, non-targets. Now, it's still a good idea to practice um, caution and just try to minimize contact with natural enemies anyway. I would still wait to apply these types of materials until the early morning hours or later into the evening. Again, just hedging on the side of caution, trying to minimize contact of anything with our, with our beneficials, including those pollinators. Oh, and, and more here, uh, just another list. Um, 
the top one there, um, Spinosad, by the way, um, it's kind of, um, it's another one of those microbial pro byproducts that has insecticidal properties. Um, and it can be used for caterpillar as well as um, sawfly larvae management. Uh, BT is listed in here. And then the bottom two, Metarizium and Bovaria, these are um, these are insect killing fungi. So these are that third uh, P group, the pathogens. These are spores that are formulated in these products. Um, uh, Bovaria, for instance, is in a product called Botanigard um, that can be uh, looked for. It has these spores that you um, have in suspension. You mix with water, spray it out into the crop. You're basically doing the job of the, uh, the fruiting body of the fungus by um, disseminating those spores out into the environment, out into your crop. And um, they, when they make contact with the pest insect, um, they can become um, virulent and, and, and effective against those insect targets. Okay, what about those resource plants? Um, providing resources to beneficials. So again, we're, we're, we're doing this to provide shelter or shade, uh, maybe a favorable microclimate within the cropping, uh, the garden or the cropping system itself, um, or to provide pollen and nectar to adult natural enemies. In essence, what we're doing is we're trying to attract those naturally occurring uh, natural enemies that are occurring all the way around us already trying to attract them and concentrate their numbers in our growing environment, okay? Um, trying to bring those predators and those parasites in, those parasitoids in uh, to do their thing um, right in our own backyards, right in our gardens. And there's a variety of ways to do this. So first let's start with a flowering resource plant list. Um, so um, these are plants again that, pr that in, they produce uh, floral nectar and pollen that's usable by natural enemies and of course it's usable by um by by pollinators as well so so these strategies once again just to reiterate that we're talking about yes it's all in the context of pest management but it's also a great way to benefit the pollinators that are out there as well um so here's a, a short list uh of some of these uh of some of these floral resource plants that um many of which if not most of these can be planted um and do well here in Oklahoma, and there's a variety of ways to use these. You can use them as standalone uh, plants in a garden. Um, you could uh, surround your garden area with these different types of floral resource plants. You can um, interplant them within the garden. So, um, you know, plant every other row or every couple of rows with these, um, uh, with a strip of these uh, floral resources um, to again, uh, attract those natural enemies into the landscape. Um, some of them can be used as cover crops as well. I, I almost forgot to mention that. Um, and I had one other thing to say about this. Oh yeah, yeah. The um, It's important to make sure that if we're selecting these floral resource plants, we want to be selecting plants that are blooming from the spring through the fall, okay? So throughout the entire production system, throughout the uh, season, throughout the growing season, um, so, so we're selecting plants. We, we got to do a little homework ahead of time, find out when is their primary blooming period, because we want some overlap with the availability of nectar and pollen as, um, you know, for, for pollinators and, and the beneficial natural enemies uh, throughout the season. So we need that overlap in blooming period. So we don't just have a one shot and done in early spring, and then we have no more flowers available for uh, providing resources to these beneficial critters. So, so keep that in mind. We want to be selecting things that um, that are going to provide, uh, selecting a, a a mixture of these plants that are provide nectar and pollen throughout the season. And there's a lot more to learn about this stuff. Um, and if you um, so beyond this uh, this this PowerPoint presentation, um, if you're interested, there is a publication that I put together. Uh, with a graduate student um, uh, several years ago now. Um, it's E-1023, um, shown in the bottom there, you can see that number. If you just punch that number, that E-1023, into uh, your web browser, Google, Bing, whatever you're using, um, your first hit should be uh, this particular article. So you don't need to print it or anything, you can have it right on your mobile device, uh, go out into the garden, um, start looking around, um, it kind of helps with identification of natural enemies, first of all, uh, so those predators and those parasitoids. Um, and it also covers 
this conservation strategy, we're gonna go really into detail now here on, so, so ways of providing these resource plants uh, to these beneficial organisms, the four Ps. Well, really the three Ps because we don't think, you know, we don't count pathogens in that. They don't, we're not conserving pathogens by planting flowers. They don't need the, the floral resources, but pollinators, predators, and parasitoids are certainly gonna benefit from these practices. So lots more to be learned in that, pro, in that publication E-1023. But there are a lot of other resources out there too. And a couple of things off my bookshelf that I wanted to share include um, something from the Xerces Society. Um, there's a book out there called Farming with Native Beneficial Insects, um, subtitled Ecological Pest Control Solutions. Again, it's, it's gonna be a broader uh, treatment of this topic that I'm presenting today. Um, on ways that you can incorporate these conservation strategies, um, these, these resource plants uh, into your own production systems. And so we're gonna cover a, a few of these from, uh, from this book. Um, we're gonna start with insectary plants, um, um, which I kind of already alluded to earlier. We'll talk about um, incorporating hedgerows into our landscapes, uh, the use of cover crops, uh, something called buffer strips, and, um, and another strategy that we refer to as, our, as, as creating beetle banks. We'll take each of these in turn. So insectary plants, as the name kind of implies, we're talking about plants that attract beneficial insects, right? These are rich in nectar and pollen, and they attract primarily predators and parasitoids, as well, again, as pollinators. If they're attractive to um, predators and parasitoids, they're certainly going to be, um, in most cases, attracted to uh, attractive to pollinators as well. Oh, um, this is just a little bit of data. Um, it's, it's just a, a snapshot of a, of a sample um, date back in 2011, so going way back in time here now, um, in uh, early July, where we put these uh, yellow sticky traps out um, in, I believe this was in a vineyard um, system. And it just shows the, the variety of different um, things that, uh, different insects that we, that were occurring in that vineyard in that one snapshot in time. Um, and the, the, real, the point I wanted to drive home is that the vast majority of anything that we ever trap when we put these kinds of yellow sticky cards out to uh, sample the, um, the insect fauna that's out there, the vast majority of the uh, predators, the parasitoids that we that we collect mm -hmm. are parasitic wasps. Um, they are just incredibly diverse and they are all around us. And we really don't even know it because they're so tiny and, and nondescript. We just don't even know that they're there. So 92% so trap catch are those very important parasitic wasps. All right, hedgerows. So what is a hedgerow? A hedgerow is a line of closely spaced uh, shrubs as well as tree species, and they're planted and trained in a manner that allows them to serve as a barrier or a boundary of an area. So you can think of these um, as a living fence. Um, if, if any of you have ever been to England, um, hedgerows are kind of a big thing, um, a part of a very, it's a very common landscape feature in, uh, in jolly old England. And, um, and so um, they're, they're, they're used as basically this living fence. It's a boundary that's, that's kind of separating um, and, and, and demarcating somebody's, somebody's land. They can be multifunctional, however, not just serving as a boundary. Um, they oftentimes serve as a windbreak. In fact, we see something to this effect here in Oklahoma, um, especially if you go further into the, the western part of the state where it gets very windy and there's very little um, all vegetation, you know, very few shrubs and trees, especially out in the panhandle. Um, you might see a homestead or a farm that's um, that might have a that might be surrounded in pine trees. On those pine trees or some other uh, tree species, they're using those as a windbreak, and that helps, of course, prevent soil erosion. Wind is a very powerful force in um, in in um, in creating uh, soil erosion. Uh, hedgerows can also be used as a source of food for, for wildlife that occurs around us as well as, as well as us, as humans. We can be planting out uh, things in a hedgerow that um, will produce fruit, for instance, that, uh, that we can consume. So uh, think raspberries, for instance. Um, hedgerows can provide shade. 
Um, so they do provide that function. Uh, they enhance biodiversity. So that's what we're talking about. We're, we're talking about conserving these um, naturally occurring natural enemies, these pollinators, and, and benefiting other wildlife as well, bird species in particular. Um, so we're enhancing this biodiversity that's, that's occurring in our landscapes. And of course, the topic today, it serves as a refuge for predators as well as parasitoids mm -hmm. and, and pollinators. Um, there's another publication that you can look for that del delves a little deeper into this whole um, how to use and implement hedgerows for increasing biodiversity. Uh, it's a, a group um, uh, that's called Beyond Pesticides. It's a fact sheet that they produced, um, and it does a really nice job of, of kind of talking about the use of these hedgerows. So, so more information can be found there. I, I, I think I found this one by just Googling in um, um, hedgerows, and it, and it came up as, as one of my hits. You could probably uh, put in the um, hedgerows for biodiversity into your, into your browser, and that should come up as a top hit or go to their website, Beyond Pesticides. And here's a nice picture of a kind of an idyllic scenario, a nice kind of rural setting, uh, maybe not so much agricultural, but, uh, but definitely rural. And this is, you know, this is what we're talking about with these hedgerows, right? A diversity of plant species that are providing resources to wildlife, to pollinators, to predators and parasitoids. And just another example, kind of serving as a boundary, but I could see some multifunctional uh, use of this of these hedger of this particular hedgerow. All right, cover crops. So, um, so why use cover crops? Well, cover crops, what are they? They're 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 oftentimes incorporated, sometimes um, off season, sometimes even during the uh, uh, current cropping season, um, to help. Uh, to help, uh, well, for a variety of purposes. Um, things like weed suppression. Um, so they, they help to suppress weeds that might be competing with the main crop that we're growing. Um, they reduce soil erosion uh, from, from rain and runoff primarily. Uh, they improve the stability of the soil. They reduce surface soil, uh, sur soil surface crusting. They can add organic matter back into the soil. So quite often at the end of the uh, growing uh, uh, season for those cover crops, we'll oftentimes till them in, we'll, we'll uh, uh, incorporate them into the soil to return that organic matter uh, to the soil. Um, they can help break the hard pan um, of, the, uh, of the soil. Uh, they fix, a lot of times they're, they're nitrogen fixers, so they're taking nitrogen from the air and um, converting that into uh, a usable form for plants. Um, and oftentimes refer, uh, re returning that into the soil then for, for, for new crops, including our, the, our main crops that we're growing uh, for them to use. So it, this reduces the need to uh, incorporate artificial or um, even natural sources of fertilizer into, the, uh, into that garden area. Um, uh, they, they, they scavenge soil nitrogen as well. Um, and they can also be used for pest suppression. So used in this conservation uh, strategy. And um, it's not a very good picture uh, when it's blown up, but uh, here's just an example of what we're talking about. Um, this is, uh, I believe, mustard that's been incorporated. I got another picture um, at the end of the talk showing a, a different use of mustard, but, uh, but the, the idea is the same, um, uh, that we're, we get these flowers um, that are, attractive to natural enemies, to pollinators, um, that can help with our uh, pest management and our uh, pollination of our crops. Incorporating this as a cover crop into the main uh, growing area. Bumper strips. These are small areas or strips of land that are under permanent vegetation. Um, so usually what we're doing with these buffer strips, um, the term buffer is basically kind of, you know, it uh, means to protect, right? We're, we're often separating um, riparian areas like streams and, and riverbeds. We're trying to separate those from an agricultural habitat by planting these buffer strips. And the reason we do it is because um, we want a slow water runoff. Um, so we want to slow the amount of runoff coming from the agricultural site uh, into that body of water. So reducing uh, water pollution essentially because these buffer strips, the, the vegetation that's in them, it traps sediment that's washing off from the, from the growing area. 
Um, it traps uh, nutrients, pesticides, as well as maybe even some pathogens that could find their way into that um, into that uh, riparian zone as well. Um, they help protect uh, from wind, um, and they also can serve as a source of food, shelter, or nesting uh, cover for wildlife, refuge for parasitoids and predators and pollinators once again. So, so multi-purpose, we're, we're coming up with some of these different ways of incorporating conservation strategies into our particular growing environment. And it's just a diagram kind of showing um, what we're talking about. It's, um, it's, it's a way, once again, to kind of protect that, um, that riverbank area um, and separate it from an agricultural or maybe even an urban uh, type of landscape from that water source, trying to reduce uh, negative impacts on that water in that water zone. And here's the real picture of, of what we're talking about here. Just that vegetation that's planted along the, um, is, a, is a buffer strip along uh, both uh, banks of this, of this particular stream here. And then the last one I mentioned earlier in the kind of um, prelude uh, slide about all of these different strategies are beetle banks. So what are beetle banks? Well, these are strips that are specifically planted with grasses and or perennial plants within a crop field or within a garden. So it's a, essentially it's kind of what I mentioned earlier with incorporating those resource plants into our growing area. Um, what do beetle banks do? Well, they provide habitat for beneficial insects, pollinators, predators, uh, parasitoids, um, and even birds and other fauna that prey on pests may benefit from the presence of these beetle banks as well. Their specific function is for biological control of, of key pests within an agricultural setting. Um, and the reason they're called beetle banks is um, they were originally used for trying to conserve uh, predatory ground beetles that um, would be um, allowing them some, some refuge for them to kind of spread out from there into the growing crop, into the growing zone, and, um, and, and feed on soil dwelling uh, pests. So um, that's why they're, they, they still retain that name beetle banks, but they, they benefit a lot more than just predatory ground beetles, um, including pollinators. Uh, here's a diagram of something we're talking about here, where again, you have um, within the crop itself, you devote some space, some of that production area uh, to um, providing, uh, put to, to planting in these grasses, or it could be again, perennial uh, flowering plants, um, that are providing some resource to our predators, our parasitoids, and our pollinators. And uh, here's what one looks like in actual practice here. So this one just has grasses in it, but imagine you can plant a wide variety of different things into here to, to help with pollinators as well, pollinator conservation. Okay, we're at the end of the talk. Um, so um, I can open up to questions that might have come in in the chat or if uh, anybody has the capability to uh, talk on the phone and call in or um, speak through the, uh, through the, uh, the, the web platform. Um, this picture, by the way, this is a vineyard in California. I mentioned the use of mustard earlier. This is uh, just a different use. It's kind of an intercrop use. Um, a mustard, um, I, I believe mustard's a nitrogen fixer. So it's helping to return nitrogen into the soil here for the vineyard. It's also helping with pest suppression in terms of uh, bringing in predators and parasitoids that can help with a lot of those pest insects that, um, that can be devastating to, uh, uh, to vineyards. Um, not so useful for pollinator uh, conservation here because uh, vineyards, grapes do not require insects for pollination. So, um, so the, the use is a little different here. But, but again, just kind of giving you an idea that these are used on not just small scale uh, agricultural settings like a backyard garden, they can be used in, um, in large scale production as well. So that's all I have for today. So let's uh, open it up to questions. Okay, and so we had one question that came in. Um, somebody asked if you can ever attract too many pollinators. Oh, well, gosh, um, I don't think so. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think the more the merrier, right? Um, there, there's really no harm in um, in having an overabundance of pollinators in a particular 
um, landscape. Um, you know, they're going to go where they can, those pollinating insects are going to go where they can get that nectar and pollen. And so, you know, if we, if, if we have a, a whole lot of them visiting, I think that's all the better for the, the plants that we're trying to uh, benefit from, uh, from having, the, having a pollinator friendly landscape. Okay, and um, I have I have another question for you. Yeah, so yeah. a lot of a lot of our members have hoop houses, unheated greenhouses, where they're raising native plants. Sure. Is there any recommendation you would have about ordering beneficials or some quick and easy tips for them? Yes, absolutely. Um, one kind of um, a one-stop uh, shop uh, for information about that is um, if people can go to a website. That is, um, I think it's A as in um, Apple, N as in Nancy, uh, B as in um, Bob, and P as in Paul. Um, so A N B P, I think it's .com or .org, um, or just just type in A N B P uh, into a web browser, and it should take you to um, the Association of National Biological uh, Producers or Biocontrol Producers. And, um, and that is, it's an information warehouse. Um, all of the big players and the small players that, that are commercial producers of uh, parasitic and predatory insects for augmentative release inside of a greenhouse environment, um, that's, that has all what, what you're gonna need there for information for learning about the, the, the practice of, of augmentation biocontrol, as well as some of those major players um, that, that uh, can provide those commercial resources to, uh, to greenhouse producers. Okay, excellent. And Our you, can next also, question. Go ahead. you can also use me as a resource too. Feel free to oh. um, you know, uh, chew on my ear about it. You got my email address there. Um, you can um, always uh, um, you know, ask me these questions as well. Okay, thank you. Um, so next question is, how long do you have to have an established area for pollinators um, until you see an impact? Um, almost immediately. Um, so this is, these are not, so I, I forgot to preface this. These practices are not just kind of willy nilly. They, they, they always go through a rigorous um, scientific uh, uh, experimentation. And so I myself have had, uh, my background is in conservation biological control. Um, I studied this for my uh, PhD at Purdue in uh, trying to attract um, a specific parasitic wasp for control of Euonymus scale, uh, which is a scale insect that attacks um, um, ornamental ground creeper, uh, like winter ground creeper, for instance, uh, purple winter creeper, um, Euonymus fortunii. And so I've seen this firsthand that it can work um, for, for biocontrol purposes. Um, so once those flowers are established, once they're in place, um, and especially, again, paying attention to having an overlap in the availability of nectar and pollen from the beginning of the season through, through the end, um, you know, it, it can work. You can see that impact almost immediately. You'll start to see, um, you'll start to see uh, predators as well as pollinators visiting those plants um, almost immediately. Again, they're, you know, they're out there, they're hungry, they're looking for something to eat. So if you, um, so if you plant it, they will come. <laughs> Okay, that's that's terrific. Okay, our next question um, is actually from Carol Clark, who is a monarch watch conservation specialist who's joined right. us today, and she asked um, if the BT used for mosquito larvae is different than that used for caterpillars. Yes, it is. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, there are a variety of BT products out there. There are different subspecies that are used for different pest organisms. So uh, BTK, as we talked about, only works on caterpillars. So um, if you're into conserving butterflies, which I know the Yuchi tribe is, and uh, Karen as well, since she's with the Monarch uh, uh, group, they, um, BT, th these are caterpillars. They're, they're susceptible to BT as well. So be very, very careful if you're using BT to not get that on your, um, on your milkweed plants or any of your butterfly uh, plants that you're, uh, that you're trying to attract butterflies with. Uh, because um, they will, um, or the, the sorry, the, the plants that you're rearing those those caterpillars on, uh, because yes, they will they can fall victim to BT. So so be careful with that. Um, so that's BTK. There's another one um, for mosquito dunks that we might use in a pond or a backyard water feature. Um, they come in like a kind of a cake. It's a disc-like cake, um, and it contains that uh, 
it's a that, that toxin, a BT um, toxin that we now is it's a subspecies uh, Israelensis. So it's Bacillus thuringiensis subspecies Israelensis. Try saying that one ten times fast. Uh, that is BTI, and that particular subspecies only affects fly larvae. So we can use it for mosquito dunks. We can even use it in a greenhouse environment uh, for things like fungus gnat larvae that are in the soil, uh, feeding on organic matter in the soil, also sometimes damaging the roots. Um, so, so BTI can be used uh, for that purpose. There are a few others as well that you might come across. There are a couple that are beetle. They're specific to beetle larvae um, and, and, and others. So um, it's, you know, there's a, there's a good, there's a great diversity of, of BT subspecies out there. Um, the most common one that we come across and that's commercially available is BTK for, for specifically for caterpillar management, followed closely, I'd say, by, by BTI for, for fly management. And keep in mind, these only work on the immature forms. So um, they only work on, on larvae. They do not work on adults. They have to be ingested uh, by those, those caterpillars and it makes them sick. And, and the smaller, the younger those caterpillars are, um, the more effective that BT product is going to, is going to be. So um, uh, they, they, they kind of lose their effectiveness as caterpillars get to be later in star when they get very large and, and kind of big, fat, hungry caterpillars. So, so, so get on it early if you're going to be using uh, BTK and definitely keep it away from your desirable butterfly larvae, right? Okay, excellent. Um, our next question is from Colin Spriggs, who's the Tribal Alliance for Pollinators Manager, and he said, sure. I'm, seeing, I'm seeing an increase in what I believe to be white flies. What attracts them and how do I best combat them? Okay, I'm assuming is this this is outside. I'm assuming because um, white flies are typically we encounter them as a big big problem in greenhouse scenarios, but it, they it's can inside. Be yeah, yeah, they can be a problem outside too. Um, so they're you know they're white flies are attracted to plants. You know, in, in fact, some of the many of the pests that we um, that we're trying to combat. And also, including white flies, can also be attracted to some of the plants that we might be um, incorporating as resource plants out into a landscape. And there's a there's a wide variety, a wide body of literature out there showing that you know sometimes the 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 plants that we plant also benefit the the uh, the pests. But but I would say by and large, we're getting more benefit by by using this strategy, more benefit to the the desirable species, the natural enemies, the pollinators, uh, than we are to things like uh, like uh, like uh, like white flies. So I think the follow-up part of his question was, how do I get rid of them? Um, now there are natural enemies that we can look for. Um, so again, if we we look commercially, we look for commercially available um, predators as well as uh, parasitoids that specialize on white flies. Um, there are they are susceptible to pathogens. So, um, so if we're going to be, and, and likely we may have to be going the insecticide route to deal with the white fly problem. Um, so we can be looking, um, try to be selecting for some of those reduced risk selective um, um, uh, products that have a minimal non-target impact. Um, so things like the uh, Bovaria uh, bassiana, uh, the Botanigard product, um, that can be used. Um, that's that one of those fungal uh, those insect killing fungi, uh, the spores are in that product, um, and, and there are others. And um, Colin, we can, if, if you want, you have my email. You can, we can uh, talk more specifically about uh, white fly management because there's a lot of different caveats here for for white flies. But uh, but in general, we're we're probably going to be talking um, um, likely either augmentation biocontrol, but since it's an outdoor environment. Um, we may be having to look at um, reduced risk insecticides to to manage them. So, so you can uh, we can follow up on on email with that one, Colin. Okay, and um, as an addendum, a quick addendum to that, we're also seeing a problem with thrips on our on our milkweeds in our yes. that we're raising for monarchs, and so yep. that's 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 a conundrum. So, what do you recommend on that? It is, um, and so our, now uh, this is outdoors as well, Jane. No, this is inside. We're raising them in like in hoop houses, unheated hoop houses. So it's it's like it's enclosed, but it's not yep. a true greenhouse. Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, we can we can employ augmentative biocontrol in those scenarios too. So um, and and of course my 
my my another role that I have as an extension specialist is to deal with problems just like this, Jane. Um, and again, there's a lot of caveats in this. So um, we can explore um, thrips management for um, for this kind of unique scenario inside of, of hoop houses. Um, we can we can do that offline um, via email. Okay, and maybe that's maybe a whole other <laughs> seminar that we do. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to be here, you know, past noon talking to people. So uh, <laughs> about something that may not pertain to them, but uh, um, you and I and uh, Colin and I, we can work together on finding some solutions to uh, uh, white flies as well as to the thrips issue. Okay, that would be terrific. And anybody else who's um, still on, and I think there's about 25 of you, uh, if that is something that you would be interested in, in de delving into further, you were certainly invited to join us, and we could do a different breakout session on that. Um, we also have a question from Dr. Carol Crouch, who's the NRCS State Tribal Liaison, and she is interested in having you speak at a tribal soil health webinar and requested if you could go back to your first slide so she could get your contact info. Uh, yes, absolutely. Sure. <laughs> Okay, and um, and as he's going back there, is anybody else who wants to type in a question in that little question and answer box on the right-hand side of your screen? And if not, I think we're winding down. Okay. Hold on, I gotta get that. Can you see my presentation wait. still? It's yep. there. Oh, wait, There's there a... you... Okay, there you are. Okay, yep. Yeah. yeah, so Carol, you can use my uh, my email address to get a hold of me and uh, and, and we'll talk shop about, uh, about uh, future speaking engagements. Okay, that'd be terrific. Well, I think that is all the questions we have. So okay. thank you so much, Dr. Rebeck. That was fascinating and entertaining and kind of scary to, <laughs> to see all those things. Uh, so thank you so much. And uh, we're hearing the thank yous come in from the chat box. And Great. so thank you. Thank you very, very much for that. And um, And I guess just... Whatever, stay safe, everybody, and thanks for dialing in. We're going to be doing a lot more webinars, so please stay tuned. And uh, if you're not on our TAP mailing list, uh, please go to our website and sign up, and then we can keep you uh, informed for when we have more of these coming coming in the future. Great. Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone, and thank, thank you especially, thank you Dr. Rebeck. Appreciate it. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.